Thank you for joining today's, today's NIO webinar. This is Lisa, the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. First, please locate the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen. If you have any questions, type them in the chat box and we will address those questions throughout the presentation. Secondly, if you have requested nursing or pharmacy and continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. The email will be sent out at the end of, the, end of today and all CEUs will be emailed within the next week. A little disclaimer, Immunize Nevada Nile webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. I'd now like to turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Vanessa Slotz, who is the Department Chief of General Pediatrics at Renowned Children's Hospital. And Dr. Vanessa Slotz graduated from medical school and went on to the University of Tennessee Chattanooga School of Medicine for her general pediatrics residency. Dr. Slotz and her husband moved to Reno in 2013 and has been practicing general pediatrics for the past four years. For the past three years, she has been fortunate enough to be the medical director and now the department chief of general pediatrics for renowned children's hospital. I'll let you take it away, Dr. Slotz. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes, your sound quality is great, thank you. Fantastic. Well, we'll get started. Um, again, thank you for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, today we're gonna be talking about navigating vaccine hesitancy, which is a topic kind of near and dear to, um, to my heart. Uh, certainly if you guys have any questions, um, go ahead and ask them as we're going through, and I'm happy to stop and answer so that we can keep it in the context of the discussion. And then afterwards, I'm happy to stay on as long as needed to answer any questions. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today, our goal is really to um, talk about how do we navigate vaccine hesitancy and vaccine refusal. Um, this is a very difficult to approach with, uh, with your patients. Issue. Um, so vac vaccine coverage is not improving among children and adults. And unfortunately, here in Nevada, we um, are below the national average in all vaccinations except for the Tdap, in which we are just at and above the national average. The good news is that we have improved over years, um, and, and so that's fantastic. But we definitely have a little bit um, of ways to go even to, to reach our national average. Um, and again, we're consistently missing public health goals. And, um, um, and so that's something that we all really need to be focusing on. Um, and sadly, our vaccine preventable diseases are increasing in the United States. And so, you know, recently we had the Disneyland measles outbreak a few years ago. Um, we've had many pertussis, pertussis epidemics in California. Um, we recently had um, the measles outbreak in the Somalia um, refugee camps in Minnesota. Um, and so these are things that, you know, while most people feel like um, we don't really see anymore, we're really starting to see these vaccine preventable diseases um, coming back to our, our communities. Um, and unfortunately, we're kind of up against popular messaging um, that question vaccines, um, the need for them, the safety of them, and emphasize their side effects. And, and this, is, a, this is, is certainly a struggle in our, in our popular uh, media frenzy days. Um, and so our first thing is kind of what is vaccine hesitancy? Um, and there's definitely a difference between hesitancy and refusal. And hesitancy is the intent to skip or delay at least one vaccine in accordance to the CDC schedule. Um, and potentially even just some uncertainty as to whether vaccines should be given or not. So really, you know, again, questions that are coming up about vaccines or there may be something that they want to, to postpone. Um, and sadly, across the United States, only about 70% of our children, 19 to 35 months, are up to date on their routine immunization. A lot of them will catch up by the time they get to um, kindergarten and they have to have uh, certain vaccines for kindergarten entry. But those, those uh, 19 to 35 month olds are just not meeting those marks. And, um, and pediatrics in 2008, um, Gus found that 28% of parents had doubts about vaccines. 
Um, then uh, 2013, AAP did a periodic survey, and they said that 87% of pediatricians reported encountering parents who delayed or refused vaccinations. And that is up significantly from 74.6% in the 2006 survey. So we're definitely seeing parents that are coming in um, who are wanting to, uh, who have some concerns and who are wanting to potentially delay or refuse vaccines. The good news is um, that only about um, one to 3% of children in the United States are completely unvaccinated. And about 13% of parents delay or select out of certain vaccines. And so those numbers, you know, while they seem small, they're definitely areas in which we can make, um, we can make a big impact in our community. And so when we're talking about vaccine hesitancy, a lot of that has to do with the confidence in the vaccination. And so trusting in the safety and efficacy and reliability of immunizations um, is really what is surrounding our vaccine confidence and also trust in the provider. Um, and that really is going to come into play a little bit later in our discussion as we're talking about the importance of provider recommendation. Um, and, you know, when we are looking at that trust and provider, if we are seeing, um, you know, those people who really trust, nearly 97% who accepted vaccines reported trusting their pediatrician's advice. Um, unfortunately, in those who delayed vaccines, only 69% actually trust their provider. And of those who refused vaccines, only 38% of those um, actually trust um, their pediatrician's advice, which is actually a pretty startling uh, number. And, you know, we can see that extending into the conversation um, towards the end of the discussion on should we keep or dismiss these patients or, you know, how should we be approaching this? Um, but it's pretty startling that, uh, you know, 38% may not even trust your judgment uh, when it comes to things other than vaccinations as well. And so as we are looking at um, how to start these conversations, you really need to be looking at uh, parental attitudes. And uh, that really helps to kind of guide where you are going to be talking about this. So initially you have kind of the immunization advocates they agree vaccines are great, they're safe, they're necessary, done. So that third of your patient population, really you're just going in, telling them you know, which vaccinations they're due for that day, um, answering any questions they have, and you're moving along. Um, then we have the go along to get alongs. These um, parents agree that vaccines are safe and necessary. Um, it's not a strong agreement, but they, they, they are going with it. And so, again, you have about another quarter of your patient population that really falls into that, um, into that category. Then we have our health advocate. They agree that vaccines are necessary, but less sure about safety. So this quarter of the patient population may have a few more questions for you, but are in the end going to go ahead and go forward with your vaccination. So you may have one or two questions about safety, or you may not have any, but um, you know, you, these are still going to be relatively quick, um, quick uh, visits for them. Our fence sitters is really where we're going to see um, our biggest impact when we're talking about this vaccine hesitancy. Our fence sitters, um, they slightly agree vaccines are necessary and safe. So there's a, a lot of hesitancy around this, you know, 13% uh, of our patient population. And, you know, because they're not strongly disagreeing with uh, the need or the safety, a lot of the times these are the ones that with um, really good provider recommendation and education, we can kind of turn those into, you know, potentially health advocates or, uh, or go along to get alongs even. The worries are going to be the ones that are the biggest struggle when you're having these conversations. So they slightly disagree that vaccines are necessary, but they really disagree that they are safe. And so these are, are people who are going to be coming into your office with their research. Um, that research may be coming off of Facebook. Unfortunately, that's one of our, um, I think, as providers, biggest um, barriers is what people are reading on the Internet. Um, and these um, are the ones that you may not be able to change their mind. 
um, you can certainly give them all the information, you can answer all of their questions, and they still um, may not uh, decide to vaccinate their children. And so, you know, knowing that attitude is really going to be able to frame your conversation when you're talking to these um, parents and, and caretakers about vaccinations. Um, and so there's a couple of different models in which to address vaccine hesitancy. And I think, you know, when we um, are looking at this from a provider standpoint, I think this is where the big barrier comes in. This is a very time-consuming process. And um, Kempe and all documented in their um, article in 2011 that 53% of providers will spend 10 to 19 minutes addressing vaccine concerns. If you know, you're on a 20-minute visit, you may spend the entire visit talking about vaccination. Um, and, you know, you haven't at that point done any of your other preventative medicine, done a physical, anything. 8% um, of people are spending more than 20 minutes um, on these conversations. So that's putting you behind for your schedule in your day. Um, and again, you haven't really been able to do any other part of your visit at this point in time. And providers really are showing a decreased job satisfaction um, when they're having to do this on a regular basis. And unfortunately, when we are seeing kids on a regular basis, these are conversations that we need to be comfortable and confident with um, so that we can have them on a regular basis, um, shorten responses up so that we can answer their questions without putting us behind. And really, hopefully, you know, if we can be more confident in our responses, then our job satisfaction is not going to be such, um, such a hit when we're having these conversations. Um, and when we are um, looking at having these conversations, the biggest thing is to have them. And so I think providers will shy away because they know that it could take potentially their whole visit if they um, are bringing up these discussions. And so, you know, if the parent says, oh, I have a question, they may say, okay, you know, you know, we don't have to do vaccines today because they just don't have the time in which to spend with the parent to talk about these issues that are coming up. But the biggest thing I want you guys to take away from our talk today is that 80% of parents um, stated their decision to vaccinate was positively influenced by their provider. I think the strongest thing that we can do as providers is to provide a consistent and strong message that vaccination is safe important and effective. And you know, we see that in the data time and time again, that strong provider recommendation, even not even dealing with vaccination, really helps to improve patient outcomes um, and patients' um, willingness to go forward with therapies that you're recommending. And so that is, I think, the biggest thing that we want to come away with today is that you know, your, your recommendation is really making a difference here. And so hopefully we can get you comfortable and confident to do this. So um, when we're talking about that strong provider recommendation, the way we state this really makes a difference. So presumptive versus participatory recommendations is really um, what we want to be um, looking at today. Presumptive is more likely to see a parent accept vaccines. And what does that mean? So today your child is due for MMR and, and varicella. So um, you are saying this is what's on the, on the docket today, this is what we're going to be doing. It's um, certainly flu season right now. We're starting to see a lot of flu. So, you know, that's one of our areas where we see it. so many people are hesitant. Oh, if I get the flu vaccine, I get the flu. Um, and so, you know, but again, we want to say it in a way that is presumptive. So it's time for the annual flu vaccine. Your child is old enough this year to receive their vaccine. Um, and obviously, we're doing the inactive shots and fluorized nasal spray is not available. Um, but again, really working towards that presumptive message. Um, and this is, in, you know, um, if we're looking at the participatory, do you want to vaccine, vaccinate your child today? That really opens up um, a lot of, oh, well, you know, I am going to a party this afternoon. I don't want my kid to be cranky, so can we do it another day? 
So you're, you know, while we are certainly in this with the parent and we want to have conversations, you know, we want to say this in a way that, you know, if they have questions, they can certainly ask them, but they know what our recommendation is. And so one of the ways in which to kind of go forward, so once you have done your, you know, your child is due for X, Y, and Z vaccine today, and the parent comes back with a question, how do we address it? And so one of the um, biggest ways in which you can kind of uh, frame your conversations is with the case framework. And so C is cooperative. So really acknowledging the parent or patient concern. And with this, I would really um, encourage you guys to um, figure out what their concern is. And so the patient um, or parent may say, oh, I have a question about vaccines. And I, you know, we all, after this talk, hopefully you're going to feel really nice and confident, and you'll say, oh, well, let me tell you all about the safety of the vaccinations, and da 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 and we'll go on and on and on and on, and their eyes get bigger and bigger and bigger as they're getting more and more information, and they're getting more and more freaked out. And they may have had a very simple question of how many pokes is it going to be today? And you've gone into this kind of long diatribe of the science behind why vaccines are safe. So, you know, really take and say, okay, what is your specific concern about the vaccine? Um, and, and go from there. And that way you're addressing that very specific concern. A is really the about me. So what have you done to enhance your knowledge? Um, you know, so I have, you know, gone to medical school, I've gone to nurse practitioner school, PA school, um, I do vaccinations all the time, I go to conferences, I do webinars, um, I read um, everything that comes through I can about vaccinations, so I feel really safe in recommending these for you. Um, science gets a little bit tricky, so always describing what the science says. Um, and so we don't want to stray too far from, from that, um, but you, know, you do have people who are hesitant about science or they find their science from Google um, and, and they're contradicting the science that is actually real. And so that can sometimes be a tricky area. And then really explain and advise uh, to wrap up your conversation. So you want to give your advice based on the science. You may have also a period of um, you know, putting in your own personal recommendations, like I would, I have vaccinated all of my kids, I'm fully vaccinated, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, to really kind of wrap up that conversation. So this is just an example of um, what this may look like in a well child visit. So you have a two month old whose parents come in, they're really concerned about the number of vaccines that your child is gonna really receive in the first year of life. And so with the um, cooperate, you're, you know, that's where you're saying, yep, you're right. Your child's going to get a lot of vaccines, more than, than you did as a kid. Um, but we really want the same thing for your child. We want them to be healthy and um, happy and to grow up disease-free. Um, and so, you know, I'm here to be able to help address your concerns. So that's that cooperate piece. And again, they're concerned about however many vaccines their child's going to be getting in that first year of life. So that's what you want your focus of your conversation to be. Um, so again, about me, we follow the CDC schedule. It has been, you know, studied um, extensively. It's been designed to protect your child when they need it the most. Um, talking about the science, um, you know, certainly although your child is going to get more shots today, you know, we have really um, advanced in science and technology to develop vaccines um, so we're giving, you know, the smallest amount of possible um, antigen in order to induce that immune response. And then explain and advise. I care about your child and don't want uh, to practice substandard care with them. They really need to be fully vaccinated, and these are the vaccines that they're going to need today. So, you know, the, the fear is, um, you know, what are the concerns that are going to come up? What are the questions that the parents are going to be asking you? Um, because they can be, you know, totally out of left field or they can be pretty um, common concerns. 
And so, you know, while I can't necessarily address every um, question that comes up, we can certainly go over some of the more common concerns that, you know, I certainly see in my office and the data shows are, are certainly the ones that parents are bringing up most commonly. So first we're going to talk about the safety of vaccines and the vaccine schedule. And so, you know, when we are doing vaccine development, it is an extensive process. Um, it is very expensive. It takes a really long time to get these vaccines up and running. Um, and so they have to demonstrate both safety and efficacy before licensure. And that's really different um, when you are looking at um, other medications. You don't necessarily have to um, show um, both safety and efficacy for other medications. They will put things out on the market, and then if it is not showing to be safe, then they'll pull them off. Um, but vaccines have to show both. Um, and so that process really starts with identifying the need for the vaccine and understanding what the immunity is against that disease, how we're going to get there. Then we have preclinical studies. They get submitted to the FDA. Um, then they have to go through phase one, two, and three trials. And um, so, you know, to start that um, with just the production of the vaccines and how they go through there, that's certainly an area where I spend a moment with those, those um, parents who concern, are concerned about the safety and say, you know, these are tested, you know, so extensively before they're ever even given to our children because they are our most precious people out there. And so, you know, we really test and test and test prior to them even being released. Um, and not only that, we have long-term safety that is, um, that is monitored. And so um, we have the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which is a voluntary and is passive reporting. Um, we have the Vaccine Safety Data Link, and this um, goes over millions, so can really detect those really rare events that are associated with vaccinations. Um, you have the post-licensure rapid immunization safety monitoring, which really uses more insurance claims. So you, again, have a lot of, of um, data there that can monitor safety. And then the clinical immunization safety assessment project. So not only do we do all of this extensive work prior to a vaccine even being released um, for use, we have monitoring um, for the safety long term to really help detect, you know, maybe some of those, um, those areas that are much more rare um, and aren't showing up in those initial studies. So the next piece of the safety conversation tends to be um, about how many vaccines kids are getting at the same time. Um, and the important thing to really remember here is that the current vaccine schedule based off of CDC is the only recommended schedule. And so um, that is really important to be able to share with your, uh, with your parents. Um, the safety of the CDC schedule was really um, you know, thought out and was, again, affirmed by the Institute of Medicine in 2013 to say that this is the most safe and effective way in which to administer these vaccinations. And again, I think the most important thing from this is that no alternate vaccine schedules have um, been evaluated or found to provide better safety or efficacy. And even um, the Dr. Sears model, uh, Dr. Sears in an interview said, no, our, um, the uh, alternate vaccine schedule that we put together has no scientific background. Um, they just put it together because they wanted to be able to offer something else to their parents. Um, and so, you know, even the originator of that is saying there is no scientific basis behind it. So again, the uh, current vaccine schedule um, through the CDC is the only recommended one for use. And, you know, this, again, often leads into the conversation of overloading the immune system. So, oh my goodness, my baby's getting four shots today. This is going to be way too much for them. Um, it's really, you know, we really want to spread them out. I think I hear that at least once a, a month, if not once a week sometimes. 
And, you know, really when we're looking at the immune system, the immune system is amazing. And so an infant's immune system has the capacity to respond to thousands of antigens at any given time. That's what our immune system does. And they're exposed every day through toys, shopping carts, playground equipment, um, and that immune system constantly replenishes. So as long as that child is normal, that is not going to overwhelm their immune system. And so, you know, one of my um, points when I'm talking with parents about this is, you know, we give them such a small amount of this, and they're going to get more by licking the Walmart shopping cart when you guys go to um, to get their after vaccine toy than they're ever going to be able to get in their actual immunizations. And so while the amount of immunizations have certainly increased, children are actually receiving fewer antigens than their parents ever did. Um, and one of the other pieces on this is, again, when parents are saying, oh, you know, can we spread them out? If we actually look at the immune response um, when they are getting one vaccine versus multiple vaccines, it's actually very similar. So if they got all four vaccines on one day, they may have, you know, a moderate immune response. And if they get four vaccines on four separate days, then they may have a moderate immune response each four days. And so it's actually better for them to go ahead and just get it out of the way and get it done all at the same time. And so when we're looking at, again, those antigens, it's really interesting to kind of go back in history and see um, how amazing science is. And, you know, this is really an area in which we can be confident when we're talking to parents that, you know, back in the 1900s, the smallpox vaccine had about 200 proteins in it. Even back in 1980, when I was a kid, I got 3,000 proteins. Um, and now, um, in 2000, all of those vaccines that we are able to do, they're only getting about 100 and, you know, probably 125 or so um, proteins and polysaccharides in all of their childhood vaccines, which is really amazing. Um, and so, you know, those parents who are really um, kind of science-minded or fact-minded, this is an amazing thing to be able to sit down and, and talk to them about and say, you know, we are being able to vaccinate against so many more things, and yet they're only getting, you know, 120 antigens in their entire childhood vaccines. The other piece that comes up in this is natural immunity. And so, um, you know, when we're looking at natural immunity, I think the biggest one that I hear all the time is chickenpox. And I'm sure you guys hear this too. So, oh, well, I had chickenpox as a kid, and so we would have chickenpox parties, and, you know, what's wrong with kids having chickenpox these days? And, you know, from a safety standpoint, certainly we know that natural immunity can be severe, even including death. And there are hundreds of kids, even now that the vaccine's available, that are still hospitalized with um, complications secondary to varicella. Um, and prior to the vaccinations, those kids would die. Um, and so not only are we looking at, you know, the um, cost of that natural immunity, I mean, who wants to have chicken pox? I'm 38 years old, and I had chicken pox when I was in kindergarten. I can't even tell you what my kindergarten teacher's name was, but I remember every scratch of those chicken pox. Um, having to wear socks on my hands, I missed my Valentine's party. I mean, it was awful. Why would you want your kids to go through that? Um, and so, you know, there's just even the natural progression of the disease is awful. Why would you want to expose that to your child? Um, and certainly low immunization rates is going to lead to that decreased herd immunity and puts the entire community at risk. And, you know, herd immunity is contingent on a significant portion of that population of the community being immune. And that really depends on the vaccine. And so it could be as low as 30% of the community needs to be immunized in which to achieve herd immunity, or could be potentially up to 95 to 100% need to really have, um, have that immunity for the community to be, uh, to be safe. So the neurologic side effects um, kind of 
um, are brought up much more commonly now. And I think autism is the one that we see the most. But this goes way back. Um, I say way back, 1995. I guess that's been quite a number of years, though it seems just uh, just yesterday. But in 1995, or in, well, in 1990, there were studies that showed um, that there were children who um, received the Tdap vaccine and then developed seizures. And there was a lovely um, documentary on something um, similar to a 60 Minutes called Vaccine Roulette. Um, and this was uh, a bunch of families who got together to discuss um, how their child received the DTaP vaccine and then developed seizures. Um, and so they did this, uh, this 60 minutes conversation. And with that, um, you know, there was a big scare around uh, the DTaP vaccine. And so um, in... In this time, Golden and Miller and Berkovich did many different studies, and Golden was able to demonstrate that these events were chance temporal associations. They were not causative. Um, and then Miller also report, uh, performed repeated studies that showed no link, and actually the original study provided incomplete data. And you may, um, you know, say, oh, this sounds awful familiar as we also address Andrew Wakefield's uh, claims um, of autism associated with the MMR vaccine. Um, and certainly as science improves, we're able to actually find out what is the, the background cause. And so Berkovit was able to actually show that there were multiple genetic causes for the seizures in these children who um, were part of um, the initial um, VCIP or VICP um, report, but also of the uh, vaccine roulette. And so initially, seizures were put on the compensation program, but in 1995, with all of this additional research, they were actually able to remove that from, um, from the program. And so when um, we go farther into this, the Institute of Medicine has shown that there is absolutely no increased number of, um, of neurodevelopmental problems as the number of vaccinations has increased. And um, in 2010, again, um, we had the uh, conversation about Andrew Wakefield, who in 1998 reported the link between MMR and autism. And this, you know, really rocked our world. Um, this was uh, put out in the, um, you know, pediatrics. This was put out in all of our major publications that, oh, my goodness, um, you know, autism and MMR are linked, and, oh, my goodness, what are we doing? And we saw, you know, providers who were becoming really hesitant um, to even recommend the, the MMR vaccine because of this data. Um, and, um, and it turned out that there's absolutely no link. So we have done study after study after study that has shown that there's no link between autism and vaccines. And actually, Andrew Wakefield has uh, came out and said, um, you know, nope, I actually falsified my data. It wasn't complete. It was inaccurate. And so in, in 2010, all of that was retracted. But the damage has been done. Um, and so, you know, Andrew Wakefield was a British um, physician. He lost his license in, in Britain and unfortunately is still um, practicing without a license now in uh, the state of Texas. Um, and he actually was the uh, root behind the uh, measles outbreak in Minnesota as he and his colleagues had talked to those refugees about the uh, concerns of the MMR vaccine. And so a lot of that population opted not to vaccinate. And so, um, you know, as we are talking about this, you know, vaccines and autism show a temporal link only, and this is not a causal link. And because the MMR is given around the same time that autism is often going to be diagnosed, so around that one year to 15 month mark, um, you know, it is going to be 
um, you know, again, that temporal link of it being given around that same time, certainly not a causal link. And so this, I think, is one of my absolute favorite graphs ever. Um, and so the, um, the graph here is showing that autism here has been on the rise since 1997, but so has organic food sales. So certainly, if we are looking at this, then organic foods um, must be the cause of autism. And you know, everybody would say, oh my goodness, that's totally ridiculous. And, and that is the same conversation that we should be having with vaccines causing autism. Oh my goodness, that is totally ridiculous. So, you know, again, there's no, um, no neurodevelopmental association with that increase in vaccines. And so the next kind of big concern that comes up and that I have actually heard more and more lately is the concern with preservatives. And, you know, why are there preservatives in our vaccinations? And can't we get things that are preservative-free and, and, um, and all of the like and all of the concern that are surrounding that? So we're going to hit uh, through a few of the different preservatives that our vaccinations have used and are currently using. So thimerosal is one of the biggest ones, um, and it is a mercury-containing preservative, and it prevents bacterial and fungal contamination in vaccines. I mean, that's a pretty good thing. We don't want a vaccine to have um, fungal or bacterial contamination. Um, and one of the big things, that, however, was that thimerosal was the um, the link to autism. And in our MMR vaccine, it was actually um, never used in that vaccine. So thimerosal was never a part of our MMR vaccine. However, there was this continued rise of hysteria against thimerosal. So precautionary measures were taken, and they actually removed thimerosal from all individual dose vaccines in 2001. Um, it is still in um, the multi-dose flu, um, and I think the multi-dose zoster. Um, and so it is still around, but all of the individual dose vaccines, um, it is not present anymore. Aluminum salts also kind of have been a more uh, regular concern that I've heard lately. I don't know if your um, parents have been bringing this up to you, but I've certainly heard a lot more about aluminum salts in the last couple of years than, than I ever had previously. And the reason that aluminum salts are used in vaccines is it enhances the immune response. Um, and so you, we can give, you know, like that hepatitis B has one antigen in it. We are able to give one antigen because we have an aluminum salt in there that's going to enhance that response. And the safety is actually really well established with aluminum salts. It's abundant in our environment. It's in breast milk. It's in every single infant formula. It is in all of our foods. Um, so aluminum salts are, are very, uh, very safe. And, um, you know, when we're talking about preservatives, the, the other key to kind of remember with with these is they're not loaded down with preservatives. They're given um, just enough preservative in there to do what it needs to do for that vaccination. And so formaldehyde occasionally comes up in these conversations. And the reason um, that we use formaldehyde is that it inactivates vaccines. So, you know, this is actually a very good thing. We don't want to be giving people an active polio vaccine. Uh, we saw how that turned out. Um, and so we use formaldehyde in which to inactivate that. And significantly diluted in the production process. So again, we're just giving the you know amount of preservative that is needed in order to achieve its goal. Um, and formaldehyde is actually utilized in all of uh, humans to synthesize our DNA and amino acids. So you know this is not something that is foreign to our body. Um, and so you know with uh, preservatives, I've had a couple of, of interesting conversations that have come up. One is, um, you know, I'm happy to give all vaccines orally because we're used to um, ingesting preservatives through our food, so why can't we give all of our vaccines by mouth? 
Um, and so that has been an interesting, um, an interesting concern that was brought up um, at one point. And, and really, you know, when we're talking about how we give these vaccines, whether they're orally, um, sub Q, intramuscular, you know, we are giving these in order to induce um, the most uh, appropriate immune response. Um, and so, you know, that's really what's behind this is our goal is to be able to give the smallest amount of antigen with the potential for smallest amount of preservative if it's actually being used in the way um, in which we give them to induce the highest immune response. And so, you know, the um, concerns, again, can sometimes be addressed really quickly and sometimes can really take a long time and they may have a lot of concerns. And when we were, um, when I gave this talk a couple of months ago, one of the um, one of the participants brought up the you know kind of um, concern that uh, that you know we're all falsifying um, our data and that there's a conspiracy and that vaccine companies make tons of money off of all of the vaccines and so you know how do you really address that? And, you know, I think the conspiracy theorists are going to be in that 3%. They're going to be the ones that really um, are going to be hard to get through because you're going to provide them your data and the science and, um, you know, go through that case framework and really try to uh, talk about what you have done. And it just isn't going to go anywhere. You know, they're going to think all of that is a conspiracy behind um, behind the vaccine companies trying to push these out, behind the government trying to push these out, and you're really not going to make much progress there. Um, and those uh, concerns about the um, fact that vaccine companies are making tons of money with vaccines, and, and you know, the biggest um, thing we can say is that vaccines are very, very expensive. So again, going back to that um, discussion that we had at the beginning, you know, they have to start at the very, very um, beginning to say, you know, what do we even need to vaccine, vaccinate for? How is the immune response um, going to look like? Going through all of the trials of, of uh, the vaccines to prove the uh, safety and efficacy before they can even be licensed um, is a very expensive and time-consuming process. And because of that, you know, we used to have uh, many companies in which um, would make vaccines, and now we're down to about four companies only who are willing to actually make vaccines, which is why when we have a shortage, you know, one company is really all it takes, um, and all of a sudden those vaccines aren't available. And so, you know, that gets offset by all of the other medications that these companies are are um, producing because it's not, you know, this big money-making scheme that, that people tend to think that, that vaccines could be. And, um, and so when we are having these conversations, I think all of us are in that mindset of, you know, do we dismiss these patients for not vaccinating or, or do we not? And there's dilemmas on both sides of this conversation, honestly. Um, I think we can approach, um, approach this through consistency, transparency, and really being open regarding the vaccine policy that you have in your office or in your organization. Um, and, you know, again, if we're looking back at that information from the very start, you know, 80% of people vaccinate based off of their provider's strong recommendation. So if you're consistent with your message and that it's, you know, transparent what the schedule is, you're open to having conversations and discussing it with them, you're much more likely in, uh, to get parents to vaccinate and then you don't have to have the conversation of dismissal or not. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of our governing bodies have, while they've taken a firm stance, they have been a little hesitant on the um, discussion of to dismiss or not. And so um, in uh, 2005, the AAP uh, released their statement that said, in general, pediatricians should avoid discharging patients from their practices solely because a parent refuses to immunize his or her child. However, 
when a substantial level of distrust develops um, and significant differences in the philosophy of care emerge or poor quality of communication persists, then the pediatrician may encourage the family to find another physician or practice. And this is kind of what I had alluded to at the beginning of the conversation in which 38% of parents who refuse to vaccinate their child actually distrust their provider's recommendation. And so, you know, those, those 38% may really fall in that, you know, level of distrust and inability to find common ground. And in those instances, it probably is better for you to have that conversation of dismissal um, versus keeping them in the practice. So we have a lot of resources that are available to us. Um, the CDC obviously has um, their website, which is fantastic. They have uh, a link to conversations um, in which you can kind of download some questions and answers that are common for, for uh, parents to ask. Um, you know, the CDC is um, certainly a better resource for providers and not where I would um, send patients because it's a little bit confusing. The AAP also has resources um, for vaccine conversations, and so they have a great um, handout called Communicating with Families and uh, Parental Refusal to Vaccinate and also Navigating Vaccine Hesitancy. Um, so there's some really good information there. And then an Immunization Action Coalition is fantastic, so it's a great, um, a great resource for providers as well. When we're looking for parent resources, obviously we want to encourage our parents to bring conversations and questions to us. You know, we don't want that to be a dictatorship that we say, yep, your kid is due for this, that's it, goodbye if you don't want to do it. Um, we want to have those conversations. Um, and so, you know, even as early as the prenatal visit when parents are bringing up their concerns, you know, I, uh, point the, uh, I point them to these uh, certain websites. So the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has an amazing vaccine education center. They have handouts. They've got videos. It's very easy to understand for, um, for parents and, um, and patients. Vaccinateyourbaby.org, also a fantastic website um, for parents and, and providers, obviously, for both of these as well. Um, and then Dr. Paul Offit is um, amazing. He is actually um, the director for the um, infectious disease at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he has written a number of articles and a number of books that really look at, um, at the conversation of vaccination from all sides. And so really looking from the science, from the parents, from social media, from um, from every angle. And so if you have a parent who is interested in reading, then, um, then his books are fantastic. And I certainly also recommend them for providers. They're very, um, they're very interesting. He's very funny, so they're actually entertaining books as well. And the other place, just for your own information, on how vaccines kind of came about was uh, is the Dr. Hillerman Project uh, documentary that um, Immunize uh, Nevada uh, has been showing recently. It is phenomenal and really kind of goes into how vaccines were made, how expensive they were, the time frame that it went to go into all of this, and, and certainly Dr. Hillerman's um, contribution to, to, um, to the vaccine story. But um, it's definitely... Um, and definitely worth a watch if you guys ever have the opportunity. Uh, so that's just a little bit about kind of vaccine hesitancy in general. Um, and, you know, I know that we all encounter this on a pretty regular basis. So certainly if you guys have any questions or comments, I'm more than happy to answer any of them now. Um, and I know that this um, will be available to you guys in order to be able to kind of go back and reference when you have uh, questions that may come up in the clinic. 
Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Slots. That was such a wonderful presentation. Uh, before we say goodbye, um, like she mentioned, we'd like to offer a little bit more time for last minute questions. So please type those into the questions in the chat box below. And while we're waiting for those questions to be typed in, just a couple of reminders. If you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today and all CEUs will be emailed out within the next week. If you'd like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars. Please visit immunizednevada.org slash webinars for those details. And we'll give everybody a chance to type in because there's a little bit of a delay and we'll get those questions answered. But um, yeah, was, I, I learned a lot myself. It was a great presentation. <laughs> Got it. I'm glad. And, you know, in this, I, again, I try to really be consistent with the R message and really open. So, you know, if parents want every single um, vaccine insert, I am more than happy to pull every single vaccine insert um, from the box and hand it to them to be able to read. You know, for most parents, that's going to be well more information than they need to do. But if that's what it helps for them to feel um, comfortable with this, then, then I'm more than willing to do that. And really just um, um, starting that conversation early. So if you do prenatal visits, talk about vaccines and that you are pro-vaccination. Um, in the hospital, if I notice that somebody hasn't gotten a hepatitis B vaccine, I have that conversation there. And so they are, again, never surprised by the fact that, that we are pro-vaccination. Okay, great so, advice. Oh, no, uh, did you want to read the, the questions that come through? Oh, sure. sure. So it says, given the relatively poor match with the current flu virus, can you help with the messaging about the flu shot? Absolutely. So this is, I think, one of, uh, this is a barrier that we hit every single year. So you have the, um, the issues of I get the flu shot and I get the flu. Um, and how is, you know, how do you address that? And, and certainly the flu vaccine every year is hit or miss. I mean, some years it's going to be fantastic and some years it's not. And, you know, when we are looking at how the flu vaccine um, induces an immune response, one of the biggest things that we see is even if it doesn't cover the strains that are in our community, it gives your body a head start. Um, and so what you end up seeing is that if you have had the flu vaccine and you get the flu, it tends to be uh, less severe and less long lasting. So it's kind of similar to, in a sense, the, you know, the Prevnar vaccine is, is great, but what we, you know, certainly we still see kids and adults who get strep pneumo, but what they don't get is the, you know, strep pneumoencephalitis, the uh, endocarditis, the pneumonia. And that's what we're looking at with flu as well. So when you give the flu vaccine, your body is already starting to recognize that even if it's not the same strain, there are still the same, some similar presenters on, those, um, on the other strains. So your body can go ahead and start building that immunity a little bit quicker so that then you're not going to have prolonged illness. It's not going to be as severe. It shouldn't be going into, you know, flu uh, pneumonia and flu encephalitis. And so that's really, um, that's really where I take that conversation. Okay, great. Um, the next question, it says, does Dr. Slots use the bundled recommendation for Tdap, HPV, meningitis, placing the HPV in the middle? Absolutely. So this is all about how we phrase things. So going back to your child is due today for tetanus, HPV, and meningitis. Um, and, you know, some people will just say, okay. Um, some will ask, what is, what is um, HPV or what is the meningitis? And at that point, you know, kind of going through what those are. Um, but there's definitely been some, some research that has shown by putting HPV earlier in that, in that list, you're going to get a better response. Wonderful. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Just give a couple more seconds here. Do you have any um, last words or anything, anything else you'd like us to know about vaccine hesitancy? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think this is something that's going to continue to develop over time, and, and I try to stay on top of it as, as much as I can because the conversations come up 
um, pretty regularly. And I think if you can just feel comfortable with addressing most of those major concerns, you're really going to be able to get um, those, so those hesitant parents into a category where they're going to feel more comfortable with your recommendation um, and, uh, and will be willing to vaccinate. And if you can kind of present that confident, um, clear message right up front, they're going, to, um, they're going to really respond to that. And you're going to see um, a lot of those people who may have been a little hesitant really take those steps in, in getting immunizations taken care of for their kids. Um, and, you know, the sad part is, is that, you know, vaccines are uh, hesitancy is a product of vaccines on success. And so, you know, our vaccinations are so successful that we don't really see these, these illnesses as much anymore. And, you know, Dr. Trudy Larson is, is a fantastic speaker on vaccinations. And what she, uh, I like her message of these illnesses are one plane right away. You know, while we don't see much polio in our communities anymore, it's a plane right away. Um, and so really bringing that up to parents who say, oh, well, you know, we, aren't, we don't see polio, we don't see measles, we don't see these things anymore. You know, we have a lot of refugees who are coming into our country, and we um, are able to travel the world much easier than ever these days. And so um, by keeping that in mind, that the, these illnesses are just right on our back door really does uh, make a difference when you're also giving that message to parents who are, are thinking that this is not an issue. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of conversation, and you'll see if you do get to see the Hillerman Project um, or hear Dr. Offit or, or many other people talk is that, you know, the concern is that what we're going to end up seeing are these huge outbreaks and these resurgence of of, um, of illnesses that we haven't seen in a really long time here in our country before people are starting to vaccinate again. And you may remember even with the measles outbreak in, um, in Disneyland, we had a lot of uh, people who came in and they were only wanting to get the MMR. They still didn't want to get the rest of their vaccines, but they wanted to get their MMR vaccine. So, you know, unfortunately, it may end up taking some kind of, you know, worldwide or United States-wide epidemic before we start seeing vaccines really start to come back around and, and, and be more accepted. But, you know, again, just feel confident when you're having these conversations with your parents and, and hopefully, you know, we can start um, moving that dial a little bit more closely to the, the U.S. national average and it would be even better if we can get above that with our vaccinations. That is great information. Thank you so much. Um, and well, with that, we, it, this concludes today's now webinar. And again, thank you, Dr. Uh, Slots, and thank you uh, for those who have participated today. And have a great day, everybody, and happy holidays. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye.